Chapter 18 of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 18 The sheriff, turning up his collar, stepped out into the downpour. In his car, he remembered, were a pair of rubbers. But in two steps, his feet were so thoroughly soaked that to put on rubbers then would be to shut water in instead of to keep it out. The campus was a pool with large islands of sodden grass. The path to the barnyard, a peninsula leading to the slightly higher ground around the buildings. The window of Gloria's kitchen showed a light burning within, and the sheriff headed for it. Gloria opened the door to him. I ain't going back, she said instantly. By night we'll have the Pacific Ocean between here and the convent, and I'm staying on my own side. The sheriff, dripping a circle on the kitchen floor, saw that the family were celebrating Glory's return. High with an apron tied around him was earnestly wiping dishes for Addie Pearl. Baking supplies were set out on the table, and around this nucleus all the younger Muckleroys were ranged, from the baby in his high chair to Munn, who was stirring up batter in a blue bowl. Jarvis fastened an eye accusingly upon the dish wiper. Why didn't you come in with her, Muckleroy? You knew I'd want to talk to you. What was the idea? Glory gaped. The children rolled round eyes, and High stood in arrested motion, pressing the dish towel against the plate he held. Me? Come in with you, Sheriff? With Trillium Pierce, Jarvis snapped. I saw the truck stop at the door. Miss Trillium? She's back? Glory said in a sort of squeaky whisper. Certainly she's back. Didn't High bring her? Hyde laid down the plate and folded his arms, the dish towel draped around them. I didn't bring her, Thatcher, and I don't know what call you got to say I did. I come in from the barn when it commenced to rain, and I ain't been out since. How about the truck? The truck went, sure enough, but not me. I ain't got no information on that there girl, and Glory ain't going back to sit with her no more. Now, you got any more questions? Yes, who drove the truck if you didn't? Twelve volts in. Thanks. A whisk of rain swept into the kitchen, and the sheriff was gone. Glory sat down suddenly, her blue eyes upon her husband in adoration and misgiving, thrilled by his unexpected display of masculine fortitude, yet slightly uneasy over his brush with the law. Not often did High assert himself. But there he stood, casually disregarding the admiration of his family, rubbing his chin with a dish towel. Later, this incident would become known as the time Pa put Thatcher in his place, but as yet it was too freshly over to be labeled. Already the short pilings of the guest house rose out of a lake. As the sheriff stepped upon the small porch and knocked, it occurred to him that the rain might be going to accelerate matters in a very special way. If the house became flooded, as it well might here on low ground, there would be no solution, other than to move the three occupants into the convent building for the duration of the storm. And if I have to do that, I'll stay with them myself, Mr. Thatcher vowed, and hunched his shoulders again. A dribble ran down his neck, his hat hung around his face, his shoes squished, and his trip to the guest house had been in vain, for there was no answering movement inside. He stepped off the porch into the water before the door opened behind him. "'Sheriff, come in,' Tolson cried. "'I was changing my wet clothes, "'something you ought to be doing also, from the look of you. "'But come in. "'You want to know about Trillium?' "'Exactly. "'I was about to ring you up, Sheriff. "'I'm too old to go gallivanting around in the wet. "'The boys aren't in, and we'll have it all to ourselves. "'Make yourself comfortable by the fire. "'You won't mind if I do a little painting. "'It releases my thoughts, like a woman knitting.' A decoy, Jarvis thought wryly, but he skinned off his raincoat and hung it in the little vestibule. Tor's hospitality seemed genuine enough. The artist settled himself with his back to the north window. The small easel held a half-finished picture of a fishing boat on a bayou, the transparent shining surface of the water disclosing murky depths. Like Pirate Cove, when they had torn away the hyacinths, hunting Trillium. How did you know where to find her? the sheriff asked abruptly, standing before the fire. 
The artist finished mixing a shade on his palette, applied it to the canvas, and studied it before he replied. It was only by chance, Mr. Thatcher. I happened to be in the library one day, reading about the life of da Vinci. It's wonderful how humble you feel after such an experience. Was Trillium there? Yes, at the end of the table I was using. She was reading the local paper, but I didn't notice until she tore out the clipping. Isn't it strange how one notices nothing of another person's movements until they grow furtive about them? There I sat, reading with all my mind and heart, unconscious of the girl, until she began to watch the librarian sister. I forget her name. They all look alike, don't they? Why was she watching the sister? Because no one is supposed to mar the papers. There's a sign about it, in very nice block lettering. Well, the sister only sees what is straight ahead of her, on account of the coif. So it was very easy for the girl to nip out the clipping, when the sister's back was turned. And did you see what it was she tore out? No, I didn't even think about it until this morning, when I went again to the library for a volume. Then I looked up the paper and found the cut space. It was simple to note what came above and below, and compare it with the paper we take here. Curiosity alone prompted me, Sheriff, I assure you. Tor laid down his brush and slipped his fingers into his vest pockets. Here is what I cut from our own paper. Jarvis carried the slip to the window. It was torn from the Help Wanted section, and it read, Wanted, Maid, White, Good Wages, Mrs. O'Neill, First House Beside the Stone Church, Marysville. So you took it into your own hands to investigate, the sheriff said. Tor smiled, his head on one side, the brush poised over the already perfect bayou water. I brought her back, didn't I? Why? Because I'm sorry for her, and I thought she would be safer here. Safer? When already there had been two attempts made upon her life? The sheriff took out his wallet and stowed away the little clipping. It was not so important, now that Trillium had been found was still unworthy to be tossed away. The sheriff's silent reception of his answer bothered Tor. He laid down the brush and, with a startling change to a businesslike manner, faced the big man on the hearth. Mr. Thatcher, I discussed my work with no one, for obvious reasons. The subject of a painting is like the subject of a book. Ideas are contagious, and the most certain way to secure my own is to lock them in my own mind. But you are not satisfied, and so... He made a gesture that took in a wide space. The sheriff tried to hide his surprise. Tor was wrong. He had been perfectly satisfied. Until now. Now he was not. There is a good deal of competition for a mural design for a large hotel in the east, Tor resumed. I am entering a subject. I hope unusual enough to catch a judge's fancy. And the central figure of my painting will be a young girl. Not so beautiful as some with a marvelously expressive face. Yes, Sheriff, Trillian Pierce. I had to use a ruse to get her to pose for me. She was reluctant. Mother Theodore's opposition had to be overcome. I felt compelled to keep my work secret. I even destroyed my correspondence on the subject. Oh, there were all kinds of obstacles. So when she disappeared, and I knew where she could be found, I brought her back. A purely selfish motive, Sheriff. I want to win that competition. Jarvis pursed his lips, nodding again. Tor was an upsetting old character, and no mistake. His explanation could be true. Crispin Archer, however, also admitted to spending some time in the library last night. Had he noted the clip space in the paper and compared it with another? And had Tor brought Trillian back because he was afraid Archer would get to her first? Either could have the same reason for wanting her again at St. Aurelian's for her own safety, or for his own convenience in disposing of her. What made you so certain Trillium had gone to this address, Tolwoltson? the sheriff asked. Wasn't it logical? The girl probably has no money. Domestic service would give her board and room. A little money, eventually. And a strange kitchen would be the last place in the world a college girl would be hunted. Until, of course, her absence was made public. But there had been no you and cry. The woman would have no suspicion about hiring her. I think she was smart, very smart indeed. Then why didn't you get in touch with me when all this burst upon you? I wanted to see her myself, 
to persuade her gently to return. And did you persuade her gently? I used a little strategy. I told the woman I was her uncle, that she had run away from home. You know. The sheriff studied the guileless old face. Tor didn't in the least resemble a murderer. But neither had the white-haired gentleman, who had fed two wives to the alligators not so long ago. There was no reason why the artist's entire story should not be gospel truth. Tor might have missed the significance of the paper clue immediately. Yet here he had been sitting, quietly painting that bottomless bayou, while Trillium cowered in a strange kitchen, jumping at every knock of delivery boy and milkman, afraid for her life. And when the benevolent uncle had come and explained things to Mrs. O'Neill, Trillium had been polishing the silver, and she had snatched her coat with the polish still on her hands, and tried to get away. "'Where's Archer?' the sheriff asked abruptly. Over at the college, he had classes all afternoon. And Eric? I shouldn't wonder if he's still in the barn. We didn't realize it was raining so hard until we turned to come over. Did Eric go with you to Marysville? No, I let Trillium out at the east door, and Franz happened to be there, so I picked him up. He insisted on letting me off here at the house and taking the truck back to the barn. A nice boy, Franz. Must have had a good mother. The sheriff grunted and shrugged himself into his coat. Uncle Tor's brotherly love was a little more than he could stomach in view of recent incidents, and he plunged out into the rain with a sense of relief. The deluge was now coming in solid sheets. At the pasture gate the cattle stood bawling, belly deep in water. If young Eric was still in the barn, the sheriff thought without much sympathy, he would probably remain for the duration of the flood. The comet was on a very slight rise but even that was to be inundated. There was no line of demarcation between bayou and lawn. Muskrats, taking revenge from the water, scurried around the old stone walls. As the sheriff watched, a trapper trudged out of the swamp and began to scatter cut-up carrots and turnips from the sack he carried on his back. "'Gotta keep him chewing,' he called to Jarvis. "'The little old mushquash is my bed and butter.' Inside, Sister Osmond was waiting with a call for the sheriff. At about the time the sheriff was slogging across to the Muckleroys, Pete Jenkins opened the door of Mr. Cohn's fur shop. A little bell tinkled above his head, and at the signal there was a response in the back room, and Mr. Cohn stuck out a hand, and then himself. Hello, said Pete. You're the owner, eh? Mr. Cohn's soft brown eyes became wary, and he shrugged. Owner, janitor, first sewer, designer. What else? I'm a deputy sheriff. Pete showed his badge. I understand you put in several calls to Miss Julian Pierce at the College of St. Aurelian's. Mr. Cohen smiled uncertainly and pulled forward a chair. The shop was so small that there was barely room for two chairs, a table upon which lay several fur pelts, and the rack where a mink coat hung. I called her, sure, said the furrier. You sit down, mister? She asked me special to keep it for her, but it is mended. The season is short. I figure she should take the coat and wear it. What kind of coat, Mr. Cohen? Right there. He waved toward the rack. Pete laid his hand on the fur and whistled. Say, that's quite a piece of fluff, isn't it? It's a very beautiful coat, Sheriff. Pete accepted the promotion with a nod, and Mr. Cohen continued. I'll tell you about it. I don't want to trouble with the law. Two weeks ago, she brought it in and showed me a big tear in the back. I don't say anything, but it looks to me like somebody deliberately tore the skins. She said keep it and she'd come back. Maybe I shouldn't called. I don't know. I got a dollar myself. She got little secrets I don't ask about. This girl, I think, got little secrets, too. Maybe got her coat torn sometimes she don't want to tell about. The furrier stood impassive his hands clasped over his blue denim apron, his spectacles pushed to his forehead. Is that a factory job, Mr. Cohen? I know, no, no, no. Mr. Cohen caught the hem of the coat, fanning out the beautiful folds. Special design, specially matched pelts, made for beauty, no reinforcement, because they want it soft and rippling. To me, it looks like somebody designed it for one woman. Pete was puzzled at the furrier's manner. You mean somebody designed it for Trillium? Yeah, I know. She is too young for Mink. 
When this coat was made, she would be a little girl. No. He sighed, glancing sideways at Pete. Women like that won't always mink. Nothing else will do. It's a symbol, maybe, a laurel wreath. Always it's mink. Well, Pete exclaimed, looking at the coat in a new light. Well, could you give me any idea of what this victorious lady might look like? Short from the length, about a size fourteen. Fourteen. Seems to me my wife's been reminding me she's a sixteen. Christmas coming, you know. Fourteen would be smaller, eh? Small, petite, very nice, said Mr. Cohen. My wife is the fourteen in the height, but the girth. Yai, yai, forty-four. Pete reached for the telephone on the table and gave the number of St. Aurelian's. The sheriff, said Sister Osmond, would call him back. But Pete was impatient. I'll take the coat and give you a receipt for it, he said to the furrier. So Mr. Cohen, wondering how much trouble he had made for Trillium, trudged into his back room after a box. The memory of the girl had haunted him every time he entered his shop. Now it appeared that his part was finished, and he was very much relieved. So Trillium is the owner of a mink coat, the sheriff remarked thoughtfully. The beautiful garment was spread out on the table where the marble maidens usually held up their bird bath. The maidens having been transferred to the floor, and Mr. Thatcher and his deputy were discussing the furrier's tail. And he thinks the tear was deliberately made, Pete. That's what he said, but why? Well, the furrier had just sent out the coat from storage. She couldn't very well cart it back to him without a reason. But why cart it back? Somebody would recognize it. Pete whistled, a favorite response when he wanted to register surprise. The coat, it seemed, might turn out to be the key to the whole business. I wonder why women wear fur coats in the South, Pete, Jarvis asked, laying his hand on the silky back. Well, this one was a laurel wreath, according to Mr. Cohen's notion. Pete answered, and went into the explanation with elaborations of his own. The result was swiftly forthcoming. Pete, the sheriff snapped, get along to Sister Osmond's office and have her put in a call to the New Orleans Police Department. I want to talk to them when she gets them. Setting them on a trail, Chief? The uncle, he can't have disappeared from the face of the earth. The sight of a uniform might open up those maids. Now scoot and get that call started. If the lines are down, it may take a week, Pete said dryly. Remember our lousy Anna storms. But he departed quickly. In the quiet room, the sheriff sat down to stare for a long time at the lovely, mysterious thing on the table. Had one of the three guests on the campus bought it? Which one? Any one, if money alone was to be the clue. Each had earned for himself more than the price of the coat in the earlier years of his success. And none was too old or too young to have been the buyer. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 19 By evening, the bayou waters had met the waters covering the land, as if the Creator had reconsidered and was doing his great act in reverse. There was no longer any question of what must be done with the three gentlemen marooned in the guest house. I'll have to bring them here, the sheriff told Mother Theodore. The lights were on in her office where they stood, but it seemed that there was no warmth in the brightness. The windows were flat, gray streams, the noise of the storm threatening as the voice of disaster itself. I don't want to do it, Emmy, he continued, but we can't leave them there with water coming in over the floors, and that's about what will be happening by morning. I'll be here, and Pete, of course. We won't sleep, I promise you. Mother Theodore regarded the grave face of her friend and read upon it what she dreaded. Tonight might come the final attempt. He could not give up, whoever he was. One more murder upon his soul would be no deterrent to this final act which must be done. Jarvis spoke quietly, and Mother felt his calmness flowing out to her. It steadied her, stiffened her resolution, as a patient is stiffened by confidence in his doctor. If Sister Laurent will stay with Trillium, she'll be quite safe. 
for ourselves, Pete and me, we'll camp right in the corridor outside the doors of our guests. If anything should happen, Emmy, well, he can't get away. The flood will do that much for us. We'll catch him. Mother Theodore smiled faintly. Do whatever you think best, Jarvis. Okay, Emmy. With a funny little salute, the sheriff left her. Pete was waiting for him in the hall, and while Jarvis gave his instructions for the transportation of the three from the guest house, Randy worked her way out of the shadows with her everlasting dust cloth, noiseless on crepe soled feet, so familiar a part of a convent picture that neither man noticed her. Her head down, crouched on her knees, she dug at a corner in the old molding. You get this gift, then, Pete, and bring them over here, the sheriff said. Tor may give you a line about being an old man, unable to come out in the rain. But you tell him he'll drown if he stays there. I'll be in the parlor. Call me when you come. Pete ducked out into the rain, and the sheriff went toward Sister Osmond's office. If either had looked back, he would have seen Mindy cowering against the wall, clutching the dust cloth to her, her eyes rolling in terror. But the sheriff was otherwise occupied, for Sister Osmond had a long-distance call for him. The voice coming over the wire was not the one he had hoped for. It told him, however, a tale which the churn man could have told if he had lived. A story of murder seven years old, and of a murderer who never had been discovered. Yeah, the dead man's name was Pierce, the voice said. I wasn't sheriff of this county then, like I am now. If it was in my time, I reckon the verdict would have been different. Suicide, they said. I remember it well on account of the woman and the little girl. Pierce was a muskrat trapper, lived on a houseboat back in one of the bayous. Never did make sense to me that he up and shot himself for no reason at all. I'd sure have talked to that swell gent that was swinging around just before Pierce died. Why wasn't he questioned? No evidence, no witnesses. Nobody ever really seen him there. Nothing to identify him. Except... The sheriff's voice died. Now he knew. He didn't need the voice in his ear to confirm it. Sure, except for the wife and kid. They knew him. Say, is this connected with your case at St. Aurelian's? There hasn't been much about it in the papers, but I've heard talk. Well, I couldn't say. Listen, you can't tell me anything more about this fellow. What kind of a man he was? You've got him there? I've got three of him. Oh? The voice waited for an explanation, but when none came, it continued. He was pretty smooth with the ladies, I guess. Brought Mrs. Pierre all kinds of fripperies. Was one of the fripperies a mink coat? Say, yes, my wife said. The voice was suddenly blacked out. The sheriff jiggled the instrument, but only a small click came back. Lines down, he said. Oh, and you hadn't finished, Sister Osmond exclaimed, fluttering about the switchboard as if she were personally responsible for its non-cooperation. I have all I need, sister. Thanks for getting the call through. But now we can't get an answer from the New Orleans police with a line down. Jarvis shook his head wearily and plodded away, muttering something about the sins of the fathers, and he moved as if he hurt in all his bones. He passed Randy again in the hall. Shrinking, she looked after him. The landing on the stairs leading down to the basement floor was dark, and she could creep down there and hide until the skiff came back with his unwelcome guests. I feels like a motherless child, she moaned. She would have a long, dreary wait in the dark. Up in her room, Trillium awoke, plunging into the immediate dread which had come to be her habit. But then she remembered. She was safe tonight. Between her and her nemesis rolled the floodwaters, black and dangerous in the dark. How wonderful it was to lie here safe and drowsy, and know that she could drift off to sleep again without awakening to danger. Yawning, she rolled over and curled herself up for sleep. "'Are you awake, Trillium?' Sister Laurent asked quietly. Mm, no. "'Dear, I want to run down to the cloister for just a moment. Shall I lock you in?' "'Lock me in. I'll be right back.' From far away, Trillium heard the rustle of the sister's departure, the turn of a key in the lock. The study lamp was on, the shade drawn the rain washing the window, all extremely cozy. Yet Trillium found herself wide awake, her eyes on the door just as she used to keep guard. 
It was being alone that brought back the old apprehension. She was safe. Sister Laurent would open the door in a minute. But her eyes remained upon the knob. When it began slowly to turn, she thought she must be mistaken, and yet the smooth surface reflected changing light. Pressing a screen back, she watched. There was something so stealthy in the turning of that knob. It wasn't Sister Laurent who was doing it. She would know that the door was locked. She would insert her key and snap it over first, not try the knob, then slip in the key with only the tiniest click. Urged by her terror to do something, Trillium jumped out of bed. But before she could act further, Rindy slid in, pushing the door quickly shut behind her. Rindy, you scared me, Trillium scolded. What on earth do you mean by sneaking around like this? Miss Trillium, you all gotta come with me. I ain't got time to tell you, but you gotta come, now. Don't be foolish, Rindy. I'm safe here. Safe? The girl's dark eyes made an arc of fear. Ma'am, you all ain't safe no place. Come on, Miss Trillium. Grab some clothes and come. Trillium was almost beginning to believe in Rindy's panic. But the flood. Noom, Rindy said in a ghastly whisper. Noom, the flood ain't going to protect you all night. He's here. A band tightened around Trillium's throat. A hammer pounded in her head. Here. Oh, no, Rindy she protested. You're mistaken. He's in the guest house. I seen him come. Sheriff's man brung him all over from there. What you want where, Miss Trium? You don't hurry. We go and meet that Sister Laurent. That was the proud Trillium needed. She tore her dress out of her closet, gathered whatever else she could see, and thrust her bare feet into shoes. Take your coat. It's still wet. Take it. Rindy was the leader, and Trillium obeyed. When Rindy reconnoitered and signaled to her to come, she followed out into the hall and down the back stairs to the old underground passages. She had given no thought to where Rindy might be taking her, nor to the possibility that this strange girl might not be trustworthy. The unexpectedness of the new dread coming upon her out of deep sleep was numbing. Into the tunnel they went, the same tunnel where Mother Theodore had stood staring at a brown bulge upon a ledge. The habit was still there, but Trillium knew nothing about that. Unquestioning, she kept close on Rindy's heels as they entered the tunnel. Sister Laurent, coming into the lighted room, where the door stood open and the bed was unoccupied, realized instantly that it would do no good to look for Trillium in the washroom or to ask among the other girls along the hall. Down to Mother Theodore's office she hurried, but Mother was not there. The visitor's parlor, however, was filled with voices, deep, masculine voices, and Sister Laurent looked in at the door. The sheriff caught one glimpse of her face and joined her in the hall. The sister needed to mention no name. She's gone, sheriff. I left for a minute, but I locked her in. She was awake. She said she wasn't afraid to stay alone, and when I came back, she wasn't there. Jarvis Thatcher heard her as if he had known all evening that this would happen. It was a relentless progression. The flood, the rising of the waters around the guest house, until it was impossible to leave the three men there, the transporting of them in the boat from the guest house to the convent. In the parlor behind him, the sheriff heard Mother's polite tones, informing the three gentlemen of the arrangements for their comfort. Not three gentlemen, Jervis corrected himself stupidly. Two gentlemen and a murderer. And he didn't know which was which. Keep this quiet, will you, sister? What an effort it was to speak calmly. You go back to her room and stay there, and if anyone asks for her, say she is asleep and can't be disturbed. The sister agreed without a word. Sheriff Thatcher, watching her go, was thankful for convent discipline. Another woman would have been in fits on his shoulder. He re-entered the parlor, hoping desperately that his expression would not sound a trumpet of alarm but he might have had S.O.S. written all over him without drawing attention because Uncle Tor was expounding upon the differences between equatorial floods and the type doing so thorough a job of deluging the bayou country. Angrily, the sheriff surveyed the three, Archer, debonair, and amused, Franz, impatient, Tor being the expansive entertainer, and not one of the three, so far as Jervis had been able to see, 
had given more than a glance at Trillium's coat thrown carelessly over the back of a chair. Not carelessly, of course. Jarvis had displayed the coat in the hope that the one who knew its history would give himself away. A naive idea, he knew now, so calculating and accomplished a killer would not be trapped by so simple a device as the sight of something brought up out of the past. Mother Theodore was apologizing. A double room and a single. I'm afraid that's the best I can offer, gentlemen. However, there is a connecting bath between the rooms, and I believe you will be quite comfortable. Splendid, dear madam, Tor said. I'll go in with one of the boys. Either one. This drew protest from the boys, and they followed Mother out, squabbling amiably. Uncle Tor last and looking like a peddler with his night things rolled into a bundle. Pete, said the sheriff, there's trouble. She's not gone again? She is. Pete jumped off the chair arm where he had been perched. Chief, the boat. For a silent instant the two stared at one another. Then, with a common impulse, they were off, side by side, down the hall to the east door. In the wide rectangle of light thrown from the building, there was only black water spiked with rain. The boat was gone. Where can we find another skiff, Pete? No place that I know of. Listen, Chief, I'll wait out around the walls. I might find something. Rain slapped the floor as Pete went out, and Jarvis returned to the parlor. In a few minutes, Mother Theodore would be back, and after all his assurances, he would have to tell her that once again Trillium was in danger, that his precautions had been of no avail. But when the footsteps sounded outside and the door opened, it was Pete who dashed in. Chief, I found the boat. And Trillium? No, but I don't think she's tried to leave the building. I waited along close to the East Cloister Walk, down toward the chapel, and there was the boat, pushed up good on that rise. You know, where the small stairs lead down to the tunnel door? There's another door just like it over under the Contemplative's house. Remember? I remember, Jarvis said. That was the door out of which Helen had come on the night that now seemed years ago. Two weeks from All Souls' Day to the 14th of December. The stairwell is full of water, Pete said, but there's this little knoll just outside of it, and that's where the boat is beached. Then she's got to be here, somewhere. Sure, Chief, she couldn't wait off in all this flood, so all we gotta do is find her. And when we do, by golly, I'll set with her on my lap for the rest of the night. Mother Theodore, accepting the new development with stifled horror, went quietly from room to room, assuring the girls that though the elements did appear to have got out of hand for the Almighty, the situation was entirely under control for St. Aurelian's. She went into all the shower rooms and the laundry, into Trillium's room where Sister Lawrence sat waiting, even into the cloister. Pete had searched the more or less public corners where manly presence was allowed, but both came back to Jarvis Thatcher with the same news. All right, she didn't leave and she isn't here, the sheriff summed it up. He sounded wrathful, but that was because there was a good deal of exasperation with himself mixed with his anxiety. All right, he repeated. Like Sister Gaspard, Mother thought irrelevantly. We'll have to assume that she didn't get away, so... Knowing of no way to continue, he stopped. Rindy's room is also empty, Mother said quietly. Rindy? Jarvis echoed. Through a long minute, he sat transfixed, so obviously racing to the same conclusion Mother had reached that she could follow the process through his facial expression. Incredulity, wonder, then apprehension that had formed to it now. Rindy, he whispered. Rindy had been deathly afraid when the sheriff questioned her. Anyone, naturally, would be nervous over giving information to the law. But when he had asked her who had cleaned the guest house, Rindy had been struck dumb. Is that the colored girl? Pete asked. I wasn't looking for her, but I'm positive I didn't see her either. No, said Jarvis. No, you wouldn't see her. It seemed that there was no more to be said. Three small people sitting in their separate chairs, but sharing the same enormous thoughts. And with them, in the fourth chair with the mink coat, sat another presence, the twisted spirit of murder itself, old as Cain and new as the discovery they were bound to make tonight. 
and she had to get it away from here, the sheriff mused, his eyes on the rich brown fur, and each of his listeners knew that she was Trillium, in tears over what she must do to her beautiful coat. She didn't dare keep it here, because she still was hoping to conceal her identity from someone. Jarvis pushed himself up out of his chair, stepped lightly across to lay his hand on the coat with a quick searching touch. Neither asked what he expected to find. The soft folds rippled as they fell through his fingers, first the bottom of the coat, then the shoulders, every inch of the front and pockets, last the wide folds on the sleeves. With the left sleeve in his hand, he paused, feeling it over and over again. His excitement was not suppressed now. Digging into his pocket, he found his penknife and began hastily to cut the sewing that held the lining to the fur. Pete jumped to his side. Mother Theodore sat forward in her chair. She almost wanted to close her eyes, to keep from her knowledge a little longer the first opening of Trillium's secret. But this was foolish, and her eyes would not go shut. They remained upon the sheriff's hands. They saw the lining open, the many times folded paper fall out. They saw the paper being smooth flat, and then Pete and Mother Theodore heard the sheriff read what Trillium's mother had written to her two weeks ago, back in that other era, when Pirate Cove was still a picnic spot for the girls on a Sunday afternoon. No matter what happens, dear, say nothing. My life may depend upon this. Nothing could happen to you there. You are safe. I know what he is doing. But all the time the mother had been hiding from Jem, He'd been stalking the daughter in the peaceful confines of St. Aurelian's. The sheriff's thumb moved down to cover a short sentence, warning Pete not to read it aloud. Above all, don't mention this to Mother Theodore. Emmy would take it as a reproach, but it was a tribute, actually, to her forthright attitude toward evil, which would prompt her to call on the law and begin her own investigation. Mother would no more tolerate a stained character around her and she would a spot on one of her polished floors. But Trillium's mother knew better than any one that there was no case against Jem, and could be none until the missing witness was found. And with the same stealth in which Jem had acted, she had gone about her task. She could not have Mother Theodore investigating, drawing attention to that part of the country in which she had hidden her daughter, but she could not know either the possible consequences of Trillium's obedience. And Trillium had concurred, blindly, loyally. And all the time Jim had been here, going smugly about his business, catered to, flattered, given the run of the convent, and yet he had bungled the first try, because Helen looked like Trillium, and the second time Mary Elizabeth had been in the way, and there had been a crumpled figure in a red shirt, lying on a roadside, with a dead leaf curled into a lifeless hand. The witness Trillium's mother never would find. Jarvis raised his head slowly and looked across at Mother Theodore. The churn man staring up into the sun from the roadside had been no more inert than she. There was nothing to say to her. She would be blaming herself, naturally, for having brought the three to St. Aurelian's. He would tell her, another time, that the ways of Providence were past finding out. But Emmy knew that, and she knew that the girl's terror and loyalty could be unselfish when the object of both was the person dearest in the world to her. The sheriff folded the letter and pushed it deep into his pocket. His excited enthusiasm had vanished. Almost, Pete ruminated, the chief seemed to be sorry he had found the letter. The two men left the parlor and went quietly out into the old halls. Mother Theodore, her face shadowed, sat where they had left her. "'Don't nobody know about this place,' said Randy. Nobody but me. Trillium shivered, although the air was close. The old closet might have been a fruit cellar in the early days, for the shelves were still in place and furnished the only seats for Rindy and herself. A candle was stuck to the floor, its flame standing straight up as if something had frightened it. The walls were of stone, the doors so cleverly concealed with thinly split stones that unless one knew where to look, it could never be found but from some hidden ventilator, air came in. "'It's a hideous little place,' Trillium whispered. "No, maybe it go save your life. It a saving place long for now. When the engines come, they gotta have a place to keep the blessed sacrament. Them old sisters did. 
and this here was it. How did you get to know about it, Rindy? I found it. Rindy's eyes were veiled. Miss Tream, you all do what Rindy say now. You go away in the boat? What boat? You all knows how to row, don't you? Yes, but in the middle of a flood. The flood's your deliverance, Miss Tream. Oh, don't say no. I done played the Judas, but now I's got to save you all. There was no doubt about Rindy's sincerity, no reason to discount her fear. She sat on the old shelf opposite Trillium, her arms crossed, rocking herself disconsolately. She had betrayed Miss Trillium too often, and for money, exactly as Judas had done. She had seen the man take the letter from New Orleans. That was how it all had started. And he had given her money, and had joked about it. He would take it to Miss Trillium, he said. It would give him an excuse to speak to her. He had fallen in love with her, and if Rennie would help him, he could often have little meetings with Miss Trillium, in spite of Mother's rules. Rindy thought love was nearly as wonderful as the five dollar bills she had received for telling him where Miss Trillium was going to be every single day. Luck had been on her side. She had happened along when the girls were practicing their ascent into the tower to hide the fleece, and she had received ten dollars for that piece of information. It had been a little harder to make certain that Miss Trillium would be at the convocation, but Miss Muckeroy had been of the greatest help, although unknowingly. And then Miss Trillium had gone into that dark office, and Rindy was there, in the inner office, because in the hall she had seen the terrifying big sister, with a trouser showing under the habit, and she slipped into the first room she came to, taking refuge herself. Shuddering there in the blackness, Rindy's knowledge of the part she had played burst upon her like an explosion. I didn't know, Miss Trillium, so help me. I didn't. Not till he got his hands on you. Rindy groaned. I's been a Judas, but I heppin' you all now, and maybe he's going to kill me for doin' it, and I don't care no how. Then you, Rindy, you know who? But the girl clutched Trillium's knee across the small space. No, I'm, don't ask me. You all just never mind nothing. You'll go for Rindy? I haven't any place to go. Out to Miss Muckleroy's house. What good would that do? The Muckeroys will have to come here if the water rises. No, they won't. They's got a upstairs to go to, Rindy whispered. And once you all's out in the way, I'll go to Miss Thatcher and tell him all I know. That killin' man's slick. He'll know somehow where you all is, and he'd... Trillium shrank against the old wall, and Rindy's hand flew to shade the candle. Footsteps were coming through the tunnel, quiet, businesslike, steady. They died out of hearing toward the chapel, but Rindy remained still, as if the light of that small flame might fall through solid stone and give them away. In a few minutes, the steps returned and went back into the hall that led to the east stairway. Not him, Rindy whispered. They's hunting you all now, but the next one's going to be him, and you all ain't going to be here, Miss Trium. I can't have your blood on my soul. Don't talk like that. Trillium whispered harshly. From then on, they sat in the dark, not speaking. Pete had been gone a long time. The sheriff mused uneasily as he sat in the darkness, waiting. He was in a room across the hall from the pair of doors, behind which the guests had finally gone to bed, an hour having passed since the last light went out. He didn't hear Pete until the deputy loomed in the door, his face a paler oval in the darkness. The thick cypress floors were not the kind to creak. It's gone, he whispered. You're sure you looked on the right ledge? Sure, chief, the habit's gone, nothing but an empty hole. They crossed the hall noiselessly, Pete to one of the guest room doors, the sheriff to the other. Simultaneously, they opened the doors, felt for the switch inside, snapped on the lights. But their brisk enterprise died when, having coursed each through his assigned room, they met in the bathroom between. Because both of the rooms were completely, undeniably empty. Couldn't I go now, Rindy? Trillium whispered. Not till they quits hunting you. We all gotta have a little time. Trillium stood up. 
No, it's now, Randy. I can't sit here like a trapped animal any longer. I'm going. Randy knew determination when she met it. Cautiously lighting the candle, she helped Trillium into her wet coat. Then she extinguished the light, and the soft blackness wrapped them again. Randy pushed the old door. She had oiled the hinges, and it opened soundlessly. But instead of the darkness she expected, there was twilight in the tunnel. Trillium kept back an exclamation. The tunnel had been black when they came down, their way lighted by Rindy's flash. Whoever it was they had heard, he must have turned on the light. But not the tunnel lights, Trillium realized, when her panic would allow her to think. This was a reflection from the main hall that ran under the convent building. They stayed so long there, Trillium close behind Rindy, that they might have grown into their positions of tense watchfulness. There was no sound from the lighted passage. Was someone waiting there, watching, ready to pounce when the old wall opened? For that was how it would appear, Trillium knew. This old closet was perhaps a quarter of the way along the tunnel. Had he seen it already, the slight slant of the wall which made the open door? But that couldn't be. He could see far less than they, for he would be looking out of the light into the darkness. I'm going, Rindy. Trillium whispered, barely above her breath. Rindy opened the door enough to let her head out and took a long look toward the arch of the tunnel. Nobody there. Come on, Miss Trillium. They slipped out. It wouldn't take long to reach the far end and the outside door under the chapel. If they could gain the end of the tunnel in safety, they would be free. Trillium started carefully along, keeping tight to the wall, hearing Rindy's cautious progress behind her. And then, suddenly, she realized that Rindy had stopped moving, and somewhere back of them, toward the main hall, a curious swishing sound had begun. Trillium halted, frozen still. It was a sound she could not identify, sharpened though her mind was with a protective keenness that is nature's gift and danger. Horrible, soft, evenly the swish, swish went on. Regardless of whether she might be heard, Trillium ran for her life into the pitch blackness ahead. Helen had run like that, out onto the hyacinth floor of Pirate Cove. Old Sister Atene had been unable to sleep. The flood bothered her. The whine of the wind and the tremendous gurgle of rain in the drain pipes outside her window bothered her. She had always been afraid in flood time, and the only thing that comforted her was a tour through the building to reassure herself once again that the builders of St. Aurelian's knew the menace of creeping waters. And tonight, she thought contentedly, she would have a companion on her trip through the tunnels. She put on her heavy cloak, over her long white nightgown, and thrust her bare feet into slippers. She didn't need her coif, since she wouldn't be seen. So, with the long cloak brushing the floor, and her small white nightcap tied neatly beneath her chin, she set out. The night lamp was burning in the cloister corridor, plainly lighting the way for the old sister. Granting happily, she plodded to the kitchen and opened the door. She had had to take Sister Emery into her confidence concerning the overnight visitor, since he had to be bedded before her stove, and Emery had been most cooperative. On her own initiative, she had brought a clean old rug from the laundry and spread it for him, and so, when Sister Atene opened the door and called softly, the churn man's dog raised his head, thumped his tail, and came lovingly to her. Equally content, Sister Atene and Taffy started along the hall and down the stairs to the tunnels. It was very dark, but the sister was used to darkness. Moving down, guiding herself by a hand on the rail, she pulled up hard against Taffy, who had stopped on the bottom step. Her surprise held her motionless for a moment, listening, but there was no sound from the black void. They had come down the east stairs, and straight ahead were the hall and the huddle of old rooms, the tunnel leading off to the chapel on her right. Taffy whined, bumping himself against her. She whispered something soothing and felt for the switch, and light leaped up in the hall. There was nothing out of the ordinary to be seen, she thought at first, but then she saw the water, a big black lake of it, lying from the step to the tunnel entrance. Now where in the world she said aloud. But she knew the answer. Somewhere there was a break in the old stones, and a leak was coming in from the saturated world outside. 
will get us a broom, dearie, and then we'll open the drain, she said to Taffy. Sister Teen had often scrubbed the halls in her novice days, and she remembered the drain in the middle of the floor, where she had so often swept the scrub water. It was a primitive old drain, with only a sort of sinkhole underneath, but it had saved her much labor. With Taffy in attendance, Sister Teen toiled up the stairs again to the kitchen to find a broom, leaving the lights on behind her. Once Taffy swung his big head and growled, but at Sister's touch he was quiet. In the darkness of a first-floor room, the sheriff sat, watching and waiting. It would still be a few minutes before he would go across the hall with Pete, snap on the lights, and find the two rooms empty. But if he had known then that the first of the silent departures was taking place, he would have followed the trespasser down to the bottom of the steps, seen him hesitate when he found the passage lighted, heard him splash across to the tunnel and disappear within it, crept after to sense rather than to see him vanish in the chapel end of the tunnel. Very soon, too, he would have seen Sister Teen and Taffy return, the old sister carrying a broom. The dog's ears were erect, his eyes weary, and when Sister Teen sat down to take off her shoes, he stood on the step beside her, straining forward, every muscle tense as if he were ready for a leap across and into the black tunnel. They were very quiet. The sister slipped off her cloak, tied a dish towel from the kitchen tight around her waist for an apron, rolled up her sleeves, and stepped carefully into the water. She had to find the drain first. Leaning over, her hand exploring for the ring in the drain cover, she was paying no attention to the unlighted hall behind her. But the fur on Taffy's neck rose. Something in the tunnel tantalized him. Something on the stairs bothered him and his great head turned uneasily from one direction to the other. But old Ateen, standing with the water cold around her shins, went on contentedly groping for the drain. She was out of sight for anyone within the tunnel, and when she found the cover at last and pulled it aside, the only indication of her presence was the ensuing swish, swish of her broom as she pushed the water toward the drain. She was doing a good chore here, she knew, because in a little while the water would have risen and soaked the trunks stored in the passage. Mother Theodore would be pleased. Thinking these thoughts, Sister Ateen was oblivious to the fact that she was almost surrounded by a cunningly quiet company. Someone crouched on the stairs, looking down on her. In the tunnel, Trillium and Rindy stood transfixed with terror at the swish of her broom on the stones, because they could not identify the sound. And there were others. Abruptly, between strokes of her broom, Sister Ateen heard someone running in the tunnel. Her eyes flashed to the dark arch, but in that second too many things happened for her to comprehend them all. The first thing she knew was that the lights went out, and with the sudden darkness someone screamed, a terrible, choked, agonizing scream at the far end of the tunnel. Taffy landed with a bark beside her and rushed off into the tunnel. Someone splashed past her. Then another clatter on the stairs, and the lights went on. As the sheriff's hand left the switch, he dashed across to the tunnel, and out of the tail of his eye he saw that Sister Ateen, clutching her broom, was seated on a trunk, her bare feet in the water, her nightgown splashed, but her neat little bonnet was intact. Later Jarvis might remember and laugh. Lights! Where is the light switch for the tunnel, sister? But without waiting for a reply he ran on. He wouldn't dare touch a switch, anyway, standing in water. Panting with Pete neck and neck, and then passing him, he pounded on into the gloom of the tunnel. Up ahead the dog was snarling, but the girl had stopped screaming. Pull on the door! Trillium heard Wendy gasp, and she realized then that they were in the small room under the chapel, and that she had been thrown against the outside door by those murderous hands when the dog attacked her assailant. Her throat was aching and raw from the struggle she had made to breathe while she was being choked, but the air revived her. She could hear Rindy's frantic attempt to open the door. Clutching the old latch with both hands, she pulled with all her strength. It was enough. The instant the door opened, water rushed in, drenching them from head to foot. The boat! Come on! Rindy wheezed. Scrambling up the steps behind Rindy, Trillium slipped over the little knoll and tumbled into the boat. The oars were there. Rindy caught them up, and without waiting to get them into the locks, she pushed the boat out into the water. 
In the room they had just left, men were shouting, Taffy barking, and Rindy moaned, The dog! He ain't got him no more! She was right. Taffy was barking open mouthed. Even in the blackness of pouring rain, the water was a shade brighter, and when Trillium looked back, she saw a black draped figure struggle to the top of the steps and out into the water. Help me, Miss Trillium! Rindy panted and shoved her an oar. Don't drop it! Trillium was not used to rowing, but she pushed the oar into the water. Unevenly, because they were not pulling together, the boat started a crazy course out into deeper water. Behind it the black figure splashed, stumbled, always making more progress than the boat. The sheriff shouted from the knoll. Pete yelled as he plunged into the water. Two more voices joined them. They'll never save us, Trillium thought. It isn't meant to be. There is no secrecy about this, but he doesn't care. It's vengeance now. Rindy, hurry! She sobbed, glancing back over her shoulder. He was coming steadily on, relentlessly, falling but always regaining his balance. Nothing could stop him. He would reach the boat, those hands would close around her throat again, and he would fling her away from him into the water, and she would die like Helen. Now no one shouted. The only sounds were the rain splashing forever around them, the struggle of that black figure drawing closer, the frantic slop of the paddles pulling against each other. Water ran down Trillium's face like tears, but she was not crying. There was no time. And then Rindy screamed. Trillium plunged against her, dropping her oar. The black giant was beside the boat, a hand coming out to grasp the side. The water was deep here, up to his shoulders, and as the hand shot out, he stumbled. In the fraction of a second, while he fought his way up, Rindy pulled away. He's going to upset the boat! Pete shouted. His voice told Trillium where he was, too far off to help them, and the sheriff was behind him. Through the splashing of the rain, then another sound came, a puffing, wheezing breath, strong and steady, and a dark spot appeared. Taffy! Rindy screeched. Get him! Taffy, swimming easily, advanced as steadily as that other figure had come a minute before. The man shouted, and even though he needed his wind, Taffy growled. What happened then was a wild furor in darkness and rain. While the dog struggled against a fighter who was hampered by the long garment he wore, the sheriff and Pete reached them. Get away, Rendy, the sheriff shouted. There was no pursuer to follow them as the girl obeyed, weaving an eccentric course across the water to pull up at the east door of the convent. The storm was so fierce that Mother Theodore had heard almost nothing of the commotion, and apparently neither girl nor sisters had been awakened. Alone, with her face pressed against the glass, Mother waited at the door. When she saw the boat emerge out of the rain, carrying two bedraggled and hysterical girls, she realized that this was the culmination of all that had happened at St. Aurelian's, but how it had come about she did not yet know. End of chapter 19「Twenty of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Twenty. Mother Theodore sat in her parlor, the front of her habit still damp from the wet clothes of the girls she had brought upstairs and turned over to Sister Laurent. Every light in the room was burning, not a shadow lurked anywhere except on Mother's face under the coif. Two weeks ago she had sat in the very chair she occupied now, watching for this same door to open, and she had heard the whistle of the train as it pulled into Marysville, and insisted to herself that it boded nothing ill for St. Aurelian's. Strange, her apprehension that day, and quite unreasoning. Unreasoning also her dread of the coming moment when the door would open again, Scarcely an hour ago, the end of that terrible interval out in the dark and rain had come about. Only a few minutes since the sheriff had sat with her here and told her that all the trouble was over. The fellow had confessed everything, once they had him. 
Jarvis had said, stealing the habit from the drying yard, his mistaken identification of Helen as Trillium out by Pirate Cove, his belief that Trillium had known him, and his resulting determination to eliminate her, his theft of Trillium's letter, so that he knew also of her mother's whereabouts, even the churn man's murder. Everything tied up neatly in the sheriff's notebook. And he wants to see you, Jarvis had said. I don't know why. There's no reason in the world why you should grant him the slightest consideration. Mother had thought it over, and then said quietly to her old friend, I'll see him, Jarvis. What I begin, I'd like to finish. Perhaps he feels the same. Well, just as you please, Emmy, he had replied. And now the door was slowly opening, just as it had opened on the other day, except that instead of Sister Osmond's politely formal presence, there were Sheriff Thatcher and Pete moving grimly into the doorway behind the visitor. He came into the room, much as he had on the first occasion, his hands apparently clasped behind him. The handcuffs, therefore, were no more visible than if he did not wear them at all. And he smiled, nonchalant. It's good of you to receive me, Mother. Good morning, sir. Mother Theodore remained in her chair, her hands folded under her scapular. It was shocking, quite a little sickening, to see him so undaunted, boasting still the hint of swagger his public found so pleasing. Mother's eyes slipped down his arms. I had thought the sea rather subdued, to say the least, she added. Already doing penance for my sins? He shrugged. Hardly. If your mistakes are written in the stars, what can you do about it? Sir, do you call murder a mistake? That depends upon the circumstances. Let's say I took a gamble, and lost. Fate hit her tongue in her cheek. Mother Theodore stiffened in her chair, and the sheriff's scrutiny became sharper. There was nothing, however, to alarm the law. It was simply that Mother had come at last upon the reason for this man's unfathomable determination, his cold attachment that seemed to stem from a philosophizing turn of mind. And the reason was so unbelievable, considering the intelligence of the man, that Mother would have been less aroused if he had suddenly sprung up wearing horns and a tail. "'Surely you did not pretend to be a fatalist, sir,' she asked as sternly as she could. "'You know there is no such entity as fate.' Divine providence is quite another matter. Whether the question itself delighted him, or whether it was rather juvenile glee over having kept his paganism secret, Mother could not tell. If he cared to gloat, he might do so with impunity. She had accepted him on what she considered good recommendations. To all intents and purposes, she had approved him and his philosophy. Oh, he had deceived her well. That he had deceived also the poetess and the friends who recommended him was a small comfort now. Upon Mother the final decision had rested, and her decision had very nearly wrecked the convent's future. "'Why quibble over a name, Mother?' he asked, as if the question amused him. "'Whether you call her fate or something else, she is an inconsiderate mistress. That was why I asked to see you, to offer my personal apology. Not that it's up to me to apologize.' but I respect you, mother, and resent the fact that I had to institute this unpleasantness at St. Aurelian's. Mother Theodore leaned back in her chair. She would not let him upset her with his cold, stupid arrogance. Calm to the point of frigidity herself, she let a long pause tighten between them before she spoke again. You surprise me, sir. I would expect a man of your brilliance to look for a better law to live by than the law that governs the inorganic world. She had startled him, she saw, and she continued, A lump of coal becomes coal, because it must be subject to an unchangeable law. An object unsupported in the air falls to the ground, because it cannot resist the law of gravity. That is fatalism, sir, the blind service of a higher power. These things must be what they are, act as they do. They have no choice. But man is free to choose the good or the evil. You, sir, have sought a mental refuge in a lower world to which you do not belong. You have brought yourself down from the place of the intellectual master to that of the vegetable servant. You, you are like a lion seeking refuge in a bird cage. Mother checked herself suddenly, 
and her voice fell to a low, soft tone. I am sorry for you, sir, but it is too soon to despair. Even now, in the time left to you, all the evil of your life may be forgiven, the wickedness satisfied for. You may yet surrender to the love of a good God. She never had liked him. Yet now, when he stood before her, still charming, handsome, wasted because of his strange beliefs, the pity she felt was a personal thing, acute and poignant. The man's smile was gone. He even had the humility to address his next words to the carpet. You must know, mother, that you couldn't have prevented any of what has happened. It's all too old and rooted in too much that's past. A good woman like you might torture herself. Later, I mean, because she didn't pray for me in time, or do so many of the things that she would consider might have saved me. I'll think of what you have said to me, mother, and if I should feel any spark of repentance, you'll know. They're very good, I've heard, about delivering last messages. He turned quickly, and the sheriff and Pete stepped apart in the doorway, but as each took an arm, he looked back with a semblance of his old amused mockery. Oh, mother, will you give my thanks to Sister Etienne for the use of her habit? It was a very bad fit, but it served the purpose. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye, Mr. Archer. She said it steadily. With a nod of farewell, he stepped into the gloom of the old hall, and the three were instantly gone. The sound of their quick departure coming back to her. They could not take him away yet. The rain had stopped but the road would still be flooded and treacherous in the dark. They would have to wait for daylight. She slumped suddenly in her chair and laid her hand across her eyes. Down where we said, Chief? Pete asked as they passed through the hall. Yeah. The three disappeared down the stairs, now brightly lighted, where they had crept in darkness after a killer so short a time before. A half hour later, when the pecans behind the guest house were beginning to blacken against the first gray dawn. Sheriff Thatcher looked into Mother Theodore's parlor. As he had feared, she was sitting exactly as they had left her when he and Pete took Archer away. All right, Emmy, come on, he said, when she only looked at him, silent. He added, We're going down to the kitchen. Nothing like a cup of hot coffee to put the heart into you. Mother smiled and glanced at the clock. I'll watch you drink your coffee, Jarvis. So it happened that the sheriff and Mother Theodore came into a pleasant homeliness far removed from the terror that had gone before. At the open oven, Franz sat on a high kitchen stool, his wet clothes beginning to look dry. Tor, in his old dressing gown with the sleeves rolled up, was buttering bread, and Sister Laurent pouring coffee. At a small table sat Trillium and Rundy. Trillium sprang up. Her dread almost as acute as in those hours, they all assured her were over. Sheriff, where, where is he? Sheriff Thatcher answered directly. Pete is guarding him. He won't get away. You'll not see him again, any of you. As soon as it's daylight, we'll take him to Marysville. Trillium gave a queer little groan and sank back into her chair. In her old yellow dress, flat-heeled mules on her bare feet, she looked like a little girl, but the expression of lingering fear was one that no little girl should know. "'There's nothing to be afraid of now, dear,' Mother Theodore said in as natural a voice as she could command. The sheriff smiled. Emmy, at least, was coming around. "'We'll get in touch with the New Orleans police as soon as the lines are repaired,' he told Trillium. "'But in the meantime, you know your mother is safe.' "'My mother?' He tried to find out her whereabouts late in the summer, a cat-and-mouse idea of vengeance. It put her on her guard. The sheriff smiled at Trillium. Don't think about it any more. He never did reach her. He can't now. The girl's eyes came to Mother Theodore beside her. Mother, you do understand how it was, don't you? If I could have told anyone, it would have been you. But I didn't know which one he was until tonight. You had company there, Trillium, Franz said unexpectedly. I should have suspected Chris since the night of mustard seed, when I mistakenly mentioned that you were Faith. You two kids look so much alike, you and Helen, and I don't think Chris knew you even as well as I did. 
So when he saw a girl in a pink veil come out on the lawn, he thought he had the right one. It was such a small incident, I forgot it until tonight. Sister Laurent glanced at the lightning window. Last night, she said, the sun is coming up. Tor heard what I said, too. Franz added, his pixie grin flashing. Tovotsen nodded sadly. I'm afraid I suspected both you and Chris also, son. Last night when I heard Chris go out of the single room and you follow, well, I tagged along. So you all trooped out while Pete and I were keeping an eagle watch across the hall, the sheriff said wryly. Tor's smile excused him. It was pitch dark, sheriff, and cypress floors do not creak. We'd have made it into the tunnel, only the lights were on, said Franz. Sister Atene turned them on just after Archer slipped through. She was sweeping, he finished, and his lips twitched. I should have known from the night of the churn man's murder, Tor said. You see, Chris was not there when I came in. Franz was in the kitchen, and I took it for granted that Chris was with him. But I know now he wasn't. He wasn't, Franz agreed savagely. I can't stomach my own smugness. I let it pass without saying he wasn't with me in the kitchen, because I couldn't think he... Good Lord, he could have murdered a dozen more right under my nose without me smelling it out. Recriminate me also, then, Franz, Tor invited. I, too, clung to a comfortably unidentifiable tramp as our murderer. I was the... Judas, Wendy whispered, but no one heard her. He says you spiked his plans several times, though, Sheriff Thatcher put in. On the night of the hunt, for instance, he made an attempt to get into the convent earlier, but you followed him, Franz. He wanted to get down into the tunnel, put on the habit, and come up out of the door under the chapel, just as the girls passed on their way to glories for the muskrat. But when you tailed him, Eric, he had to wait till later, and take a long chance in the tower. And he failed, where he probably wouldn't have failed outside. Do we have to talk about it any more? Trillian whispered. I am so grateful to all of you. I can't even express it. But I... I can't bear to go over it. Mother Theodore's arm was around her, but Trillium shivered. He'd have killed us just for the killin', Randy said in a ghostly wheeze. He'd have upset the boat and drowned us, and all the time knowing he couldn't get away, cause the devil was riding that man. The dark, it didn't make no difference, nor the water, nor the law coming up behind him, cause he had to kill, that's all. Mother Theodore surprisingly nodded. He had to kill, that was the answer. He didn't know how to stop. His intelligence could not guide him because of his fatalistic belief that all this was written in the stars. As he said, everything determined for him long before he lived. How pitiable. But end it, mother, says Sister Laurent. The sheriff straightened, his eyes on the window, as if the breaking light outside was a signal. He crossed the kitchen with that peculiar, poised step, all heads turning to follow him, because everyone knew where he was going and why. At the door he paused, looking back at each in turn. When he came to Mother Theodore, he nodded faintly. Then he opened the door and was gone. A few minutes later, the sheriff and Pete started silently out of the underground room, between them an equally silent figure, fastened to Pete by handcuffs. So intent were they upon making a noiseless departure that, until the dog growled, they failed to notice him with Sister Atene in the high old arch of the tunnel. They halted, all of them taken aback except for the old sister, who saw nothing out of the ordinary in such a meeting. She was becoming quite used to running across men in the tunnels. Her sweet smile lighted her face. Good morning, Mr. Thatcher, and, oh, it's Mr. Archer, isn't it? There was something so childlike and guileless about the little nun that the sheriff instinctively stepped in front of Archer as if to shield her from evil. Too low for the sister to hear, Crispin said, Don't worry, sheriff. But Jarvis Thatcher remained where he was. Taffy sidled closer to Sister Teen, wary, his big muscles tense. Will you excuse us, sister? the sheriff asked quietly, 
We are in something of a hurry. Oh, certainly. Perhaps another time. But Taffy was acting so badly now that she caught a handful of his neck fur to try to shake some sense into him. As the men passed, the dog pushed her backward and growled deep in his throat. Why, Taffy! Sister Teen exclaimed. The steps sounded swiftly, going up the stairs. Then the east door closed on the landing. With the sound, the dog's head dropped, and all the animosity left him. The place now was very quiet. It almost seemed that the old remembered peace had returned to St. Aurelian's. End of chapter 20 End of Murder Takes the Veil by Margaret Ann Hubbard